these are the times that drive men's souls. Good morning. Please stand and join with us as we sing. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Just in case you don't know me, I'm Susan Manning, and I'm the Deacon of Hospitality. And I just want to welcome everybody, everybody this morning. I'm not used to talking into this thing. Um, if it's your first time, you'll find in front of you, in the back of the chair in front of you, there's a connection card. So if you're the first timer, if you're visiting here with somebody that is a member of the church, please fill out this card and drop it into the offering plate as it comes around. And I just hope to see you all again. <laughs> Thanks.
And while you're working way back to your seats, uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Jason Hurlbut. Uh, I've been around for a long time, and as such, I've been asked to kind of do this little short presentation. I don't know how many of you have noticed. You want to throw that slide up, Weston? How many of you have seen this brick right out here? I don't even know where it's at. Okay, it's a few of you, okay? That's, that's actually stuck in the side of the building right next to the door out here. So see the date on there, July 28th, 2002? That's been 20 years that we've been in this portion of the building. We were in the back section for a couple of years doing services before that, but it's been 20 years that we've been up here in the front side. Um, Easter Sunday that year was actually the first year we had service in this room. So in that 20 years, uh, there have been a lot of changes, a lot of things came up. Um, where we sit for worship service, uh, so we started in the sanctuary, officially completed in July of 2002, but we were in the gym for a couple of years. Uh, the leadership in this church has changed. We've had two pastors, trustees, lead team, deacons, elders. How we do things have changed. Uh, the programs that we pursue here at the church, Awanas has come and gone, TNT, um, egg roll fundraisers, for those of you who remember those, uh, Camp Muscatine, handbell choirs. A lot of the faces have changed in those 20 years. Uh, many have moved away, some have passed on and are now in heaven. Um, many of you have been born and raised in here. Uh, my daughters grew up in this church. My oldest daughter, Catherine, actually came from the hospital to here so my mom could show her off to everybody before we went home. Um, now she is 22, 23 years old, whatever it is now, 22, I guess. I don't have to know. I'm the dad. Um, many of us have, hairstyles have changed in 20 years. Some have come and gone. Um, a little more gray, whatever it is. Um, the colors in this church have went from like this tan. If you go down to the kids' wing, then the room is a lot more color now. But in those 20 years, there are a few things that have not changed also. God is still good and always will be. The carpet is still on the walls and will be for quite some time. And quite most importantly for this little portion of the service, we have had one secretary in the church. Barb, if you would step up this way, please. <clears throat> she will absolutely hate this part. Barb absolutely hates us because she does not like to be recognized. She's always doing things. She's always in the, in the office, upstairs in the sound booth. She's got a little help to drag her up here this time, however. Today we would like to celebrate the 20 years of your service. I know that was right about May 1st, as best we can tell from the records that we looked at. Um, that was from the 2002 directory and the most recent directory that we have. <laughs> Thank you. So today, Barb, we just want to thank you for your 20 years of service to the church, um, for your dedication, for everything you've done, in addition to your work, but just in your, your service here within the church. And I believe Diane has a little something to say. There will be cookies in the foyer in between service and groups to help celebrate my grandma. In addition to that, obviously, Charlotte has some flowers for you. And Addie has a bucket of cards from everyone within the church. Your daughters have sneakily asked everyone to write you a little card. <laughs> you can beat them for it afterwards. It's okay. <laughs> They're still your daughters. You can get away with that. Yeah. Um, and at this time, I just want to take a moment and just pray for you, Barb, and thank you for all you've done. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity you have, you have given us for the service that you have, service heart you have given Barb to serve this church, to dedicate so much time and effort that she has, Lord, to the lives that, he has, that she has touched and to the expansion of the kingdom that we've gotten from that. We just thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, thank Barb. You.
Well, good morning. I'm Brian. I've got a couple of announcements uh, for you. All the announcements are in the bulletin, so you can check those out uh, in greater detail. But first off, we want to raise up the 21 days of prayer that has started already, but it's not too late to start praying. Uh, our, we have a, a group going to Senegal to work with Brad and Deb Mashburn, who we've partnered with for years. We're actually going to go over there and be a part of the mission on site there in Senegal. We can't all go, but we do need your prayers as they go. And so even if you're a little late, we do have a few of these books out in front in the foyer. Grab one of those. It'll walk you through some information about what's going on in Senegal, how you can pray specifically, uh, and then also just kind of transition as the team leaves on July 11th. On July 10th, during the topical class time in the uh, Fellowship Hall, that topical class time will be dedicated to just praying for that group uh, and the mission that they're going to undergo, safe travels and success, success in uh, reaching the lost there. Next, July 3rd, we are going to have, so that's next Sunday, we are going to have a church-wide picnic to celebrate the 4th of July during group time, so there won't be normal groups, but uh, we'll, we'll provide the, I think we're providing the main course, you bring the sides, the desserts, all that fun stuff, and we'll just have a good time. If you've got a favorite game, indoor, outdoor, bring that with. You can set it up and host it uh, and play games with friends and just a good time uh, of spending time together. Finally, beginning on July 17th, the new topical class. This is a study from my employer, Compass Finances God's Way. So this is targeted for anyone who is going to die someday. Can I get a show of hands? That's all of you, okay? So this is a biblical approach to organizing and communicating with your loved ones. And so none of us want to talk about the fact that we're going to die, but it is going to happen. One of the downsides is if you're young, so if you're old, you have the benefit of you probably talked about this a little bit, but it's closer, right? More than likely. But you've had some time to talk about that kind of stuff. If you're young, you need it just as much. Because while it's unlikely, it will be even more difficult for those you leave behind, right? If Erica dies tonight, the last thing I want to talk about is what she wants done at her funeral. And I need that written down. I need her to tell me what that's going to be so that I don't have to make that decision. Because the last thing I want to think about dealing with my four kids and how do I explain this is what's her funeral going to be like. And so this course uh, is seven weeks long. And so it is intended to walk you through making those decisions in a biblical fashion. And also how do you document it and leave it in a place where your loved ones aren't left holding the bag with if and when that happens, okay? So signups for this are in uh, the Ministry Resource Center. We are asking that you contribute to the cost of these workbooks. Uh, they're fairly significant sized, and so we're asking if you want a printed copy to contribute $10 or $15. If you want an interactive ebook, you still get to answer the questions. It's just all online on your tablet. Uh, it's $10, but please sign up for that. We have to have books, so this is not something you can just sit in on and kind of get the gist. You actually have to have a book uh, that'll walk you through that. And so uh, myself and Mike Ward will be leading that over those seven weeks, beginning July 17th. If you're going to miss some of those days, but you want to take it anyway, sign up for it, get the book. You can work through it on your own. Uh, and if uh, you can't afford the contribution, don't let that stop you. We'll figure it out. Okay. So now we're going to go and praise God in worship.
What would Jesus do? We, uh, we sometimes wear that on a shirt or a hat, maybe even a tie. And 
And the reason we, we ask that is so we can be more like Jesus and so we can make the decisions that he made and act like he acted to walk in his footsteps. And uh, a good question, a good way to find the answer to that is ask what, Je what did Jesus do? Um, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, this is out of the ERV. I'd like to read this. He was like God in every way, but he did not think that his being equal with God was something to use for his own benefit. Instead, he gave up everything, even his place with God. He accepted the role of a servant, appearing in human form. During his life as a man, he humbled himself by being fully obedient to God, even when that caused his death, death on a cross. So Jesus decided in his heart that it would be it would bring him more joy to save a sinner than to, to stay in the splendor of heaven. That enduring the instability of being here on the earth, when he, when he left the stability of heaven, um, he had no substance here on the earth. He had, a, am sure, a pretty comfortable throne in heaven. And when he came to earth, he had no place to even lay his head, he says. The ridicule, the rejection of his own disciples, and then the pain and death on the cross. And Jesus said, it is still worth it to save a sinner like you or to save a sinner like me. Jesus did this for us, not because who we are, but because who he is. And that's what makes him worthy. And in verse 9, so God raised him up to the most important place and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. The humility that Jesus displayed here is the humility when we ask what would Jesus do that's the answer we should come up with
night before Jesus was getting ready to give it all on the cross, the culmination of his, his love and his sacrifice, his humility, he took the, his disciples to the upper room and he broke the bread and he told them this, is, this represents his body that's going to be broken for them to bring them salvation. Take and eat. Jesus then took the cup and told him that this represents his blood that's going to guarantee salvation to all of mankind. Our own blood is not, our own sinful blood is not going to make it. But Jesus' perfect blood that he was willing to shed on the cross will guarantee eternal life. Jesus traded his eternal life for mortality and death so that we could tra trade our mortality and death for eternal life in his kingdom. Drink ye all of it in remembrance of Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the humility, the love that sent Jesus to the cross that day. And Father, when we, when we go through this life, as we as we have a question on what to do, as we have a decision to make, Father, I just pray that you would help us to remember what would Jesus do and what did Jesus do? The humility, the love, and the faithfulness to you on the cross that day. Father, we pray that we would be the representatives on this earth for you. And we pray that as Jesus brought you glory, that we would bring you glory as well in all that we do. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'd like, to, I'd like to thank you all for being here, both here and online. Today we'll be diving into Matthew chapter 13, verses 40 through, 44 through 46. If you do not have a Bible with you and wish to follow along, feel free to grab one from the seats in front of you. And if you do not have one at home, feel free to take this one with you as a gift from us. If you happen to grab a large print version, we will be on page 974. And for a small print version, we will be on page 819. This will be the parable of the hidden treasure, followed by the parable of the pearl of great value. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. The word of the Lord. Thank you. All right, good morning. So we are in the series about the parables of Jesus. So we've been, uh, last week we took a break to talk about the importance of meeting uh, together here on Sundays, but we are back to the parables. Here are short stories. Give it more volume. They say they got to hear it. Keep talking. All right, there we go. Now we got to go, woo, getting a little hot. All right, so parables are short stories that teach a spiritual lesson. It's as simple as that. Jesus loved parables. He loved teaching with parables. Uh, and we get a couple new ones here to work through this set that goes together. So these two, as you may have noticed, uh, are pretty concise, aren't they? So we get a whopping three sentences, 
three verses to cover two full parables. Uh, and in their brevity, they introduce a lot of really interesting topics that are kind of just tangential to what's going on here. So we get introduced to this question of what's the kingdom like? Uh, and so Jesus has been there, obviously, and throughout his ministry, he tries to explain it, but it's clear that we can't really comprehend it. So he's always using analogies, right? What's the kingdom like? How shall I explain it? We hear other places visions of what the kingdom is like, but there aren't really words that describe it. And so we get a series of analogies here. We get introduced to this question of, is there something that can obtain the kingdom? Right? So in the analogy, somebody sells something so that they can buy the treasure which represents the kingdom. And so we start to talk about what, what role do I have in obtaining the kingdom? We get introduced to the idea of how do our actions here impact the magnitude of our joy in heaven, right? So we hear throughout scripture about rewards, where there are great rewards and there are little rewards, which somehow impact how great heaven is for us. We hear about the five crowns, right, that we get to lay at Jesus's feet, and there are things we can do to obtain the crown so that when we show up, we have something to give Jesus. And all these things are introduced in these short little three sentences, but they're distractions for us that we got to get past. Uh, because in these three sentences, two parables, they focus on one main teaching, and they are so short that we get to dissect it. Uh, and as we get to that, let's go ahead and open up in prayer so that God can speak to us. Father, we thank you so much for this day and for this church and for the work that you're doing here. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, his life and his death, his willingness to sacrifice for us, Lord. We pray, God, that you would humble us to your word and to your message, that you would make us a vessel for your Holy Spirit today, that we would hear your message clearly, that we would see it in our lives, and that we would go pursue and obtain that treasure that you've offered to us. God, we all come to you broken and full of sin, distracted by all the things going on in our lives and in this world around us. And God, we need to just focus on you, and we pray, God, that you would help us to do that, that you would carry us through this burden. God, open our hearts and our minds to the message that you have for us today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's go ahead and get our bearings here. So we are in the middle of Jesus's ministry. So he's not, he, he didn't just get started, uh, but he's not walking up to the cross. So we're, we're right in the middle, and he is in this series of eight parables that he kind of just goes one after another after another. And a lot of these parables are presented to the crowds and the Pharisees and the scribes, right? So this is where we talked about, there's quite a bit of eye poking. So over here, he's giving a message of positive salvation, hey, I've come to redeem you, it's great. And then over here, he's talking to the Pharisees, like here, I, you know, you guys are the knuckleheads and you're not going to get in the kingdom and that's your choosing, and I'm going to step on your toes and poke, on your, poke you in the eyes. But the good thing is, these parables are only addressing the disciples. So in the middle of this uh, series of the eight parables, Jesus and his disciples go into a house without the Pharisees, without the scribes, and now they can focus on the great news that Jesus has for them. And so Jesus explains what they, the disciples ask Jesus to explain the parable, the weeds to him. He does that, and then he goes into these two parables. And they're very positive, they're very encouraging, they're very motivating. But what we miss often as we read through these two parables is that while they seem at first glance to be a, re, a repetition, right? You read the first one, and then you read the second one, and you think, well, I just heard the same thing twice. We actually miss a very important detail that we'll talk through. They're actually presenting opposite sides of the same coin. They teach the same lesson, but it's very important and very uplifting as we see that they're actually talking about two opposite instances. And the topic that they're going to focus on is the idea of redemption. So I want to talk about this word real quickly. So we have Christian words, don't we? Can we just admit that? So let me give you an example. Atonement, right? What, anybody use atonement this week outside of talking about their walk with Christ? Anybody 
you know, get a parking ticket downtown because you fed the meter, but you got stuck talking for longer, and then you had to go into the county office and atone for your illegal parking. Did you say that? I didn't say that, right? Atonement is, it's a Christian word. We use it in the context of church, but we don't use it in the context of the rest of our life. And redeem is interesting because it's like a half-Christian word. We know the redemption of Jesus, and I know that I redeem my bottles and cans, but I don't connect the two, do I? I got my faith redemption, and I got my bottles and cans redemption, and the two somehow are disconnected, but they're not disconnected. They mean the same thing. What redemption is, is it's the exchange of something of little value for something of greater value. Right? So if I have a coupon for 50 cents off, right, what's that coupon actually worth? It's worth nothing. It's just a piece of paper. But what I can do is I can redeem it for the promise of a 50 cent discount. Even though it's a piece of paper of very little value, the promise that it holds is actually the value. Same thing with a gift card. If I get a gift card for my birthday, that little piece of plastic isn't actually worth anything, is it? But if I take it to the store in question and I say, I would like to redeem this, I would like to exchange this piece of plastic for the $25 that's been promised, they honor that promise. That's what redemption is. And so that's what we're talking talking about here in these parables is the idea that I'm going to take the earthly treasure which has little to no eternal value and I'm going to exchange it for something of great value. This is redemption, whether I'm talking about bottles and cans or whether I'm talking about souls. And so let's dissect the hidden treasure here. So it starts out, the kingdom of heaven is like. So again, this is we are describing what the kingdom of heaven is like. We can't comprehend what the kingdom of heaven is like, so Jesus is going to give us an analogy to help us. Well, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. So we all know what a treasure is, right? It's a thing of great value. Now this treasure, it's hidden in a field, so it's hard to obtain, right? It's hidden in a field, and a man finds it and covers it up. We've got to stop here because this is just weird to us. This seems like a crooked deal, doesn't it? This feels shady. If I'm out mowing the church lawn and I stumble upon a pile of gold, is it okay for me to just throw some grass clippings on top of it and then go make an offer to the church? This is not okay, right? This is a cultural separation here. The culture of the day, this would have been okay. So think about, think about this, and we'll, we'll take a break from the, the big lesson, because this is a distraction that we can get focused on this and miss the point. So we got to address it so we can move past it. In this day and age, this is a thousands of years of occupation, right? And so if I'm living in this day and age, the worst place I can put my money is the bank. Because you know what happens when the Roman soldiers come to town and they need some money? Where are they going to go? They're going to go to the bank. And they're just going to take it because they have the right to do that. And so this situation is so common it comes up in other parables, so the parables of the talents, the parables of the minus, right? The people bury it in the ground. This is normal. Because what you do is, if you had some money, you didn't want the Roman folks to come take it, you'd go find some spot that only you know about, you dig a hole, it's not paper money, it's, it's metal money, so it doesn't degrade in the ground, and you put it there, right? And so the hope is, someday, you go back and you get it. But a lot of times what happens, because they haven't gone through the Set Your House in Order study, they've buried it someplace and their spouse doesn't know where it's at. This should be in a notebook somewhere, right? And so this is just lost forever. And so there, was, there were actually, if you read uh, the book Parables by John MacArthur, he's got a really good explanation. I won't walk you through it. We've got it in the library. I've got it in my office. It's on page 46. There were actually Hebrew laws, not Levitical laws, but like Ferris pharisite pharisaical laws i think that's the right word where they said here here are the ground rules if if it's between the floorboards this is who it belongs to and if it's within this distance of the threshold inside the door it belongs to this person and outside the door it belongs to this person and if it's in a field it belongs to this person and so there were clear ground rules that the disciples would have understood they just would have gone right past this but we kind of get hung up on it and think, well, maybe this is a shady kind of deal. It's 
not a shady kind of deal. Okay? So, he finds the treasure, he covers it up, and then what does he do? He sells everything. He sells everything to obtain that field. But we jump over an important part. How does he do it? Does he do it out of obligation? In his joy. This is how great the treasure is, isn't it? In his joy, he sells everything. He doesn't feel obliged. He doesn't feel compelled. In his joy, there's nothing that will stand in his way because of this treasure. And so the meaning here is pretty simple to look at, isn't it? We should recognize the immense treasure before us, and we should let nothing stand in our way from obtaining it. We should redeem the things of this world that are temporary and go get the eternal treasure that is everlasting. Problem is, it's kind of hard to surrender all, even if we see the treasure for what it is, isn't it? If we look at some of the people in Scripture, there are a lot of people who got this wrong. Solomon. You remember Solomon? So he's, he's the son of King David. He stands face to face with God, and God says, what can I do to help you get started? I'll give you anything you want. And Solomon makes a great choice. He says, I want the wisdom to lead your people well. What an amazing choice. This is, probably is not what I would have picked, right? And God says, that's terrific. That's the best thing you could have asked for. I'll give you that, and I'll give you everything you didn't ask for. This is a good start. But how does Solomon's life end? He takes 700 wives from other countries. Scripture was clear, do not take lots of wives and do not take any wives from other countries or you will abandon me. You will worship their gods. And that's exactly what happens to Solomon. Scripture is clear that the kings of Israel are not to go to Egypt to get horses. And don't amass an army of chariots for yourself because then you'll rely on yourself instead of me. But what's Solomon do? He goes to Egypt to get horses and he gets a bunch of chariots for himself. And so he gets distracted by all these things and he forgets about that beautiful treasure that God offered him in the first place. We hear about three guys who encounter Jesus. We don't get their names. The first guy says, I want to follow you. And Jesus says, yeah, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but me, I don't have any place to take a nap. We never hear about the guy again. Apparently he can't, he can't handle that. The second guy, he's willing to follow. He just wants to bury his dad first. Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. I got things to do. The third guy simply wants to say goodbye to his family first, and Jesus, he doesn't have time to wait. Once you put your hand to your plow, you can't turn back around. We never hear about the guy again. We hear the story of the rich young man. The rich young man comes up to Jesus. He knows what he's looking at. He knows this is the Messiah. We see that, and he says, what can I do to get everlasting life? Jesus says, well, this is, this is simple. Go follow the Ten Commandments. The guy boldly says, yeah, check. Got that. Done that for years. What else do I got to do? And Jesus spots his weakness, and he says, Oh, just go sell everything and follow me and take the treasure. And he walks away heartbroken because he had a lot of treasure. And he couldn't separate himself. He couldn't get over the distraction of his stuff in order to focus and to secure the eternal gift that's been offered to him. Each of these people had other priorities that they couldn't give up. And I want to focus on the attitude again. Are any, is, is Solomon, these three guys, the rich young man, are any of them described as being joyful when they make those choices? No, their joy was distracted. The man in the parable, in his joy, in his joy he sells everything. It's his joy that leads him to follow the Lord. It's his joy that leads him to obtain the treasure at any cost. And that's how we should feel about the gift of salvation that we've been offered, isn't it? We should recognize 
the magnitude and the magnificence of the treasure that's before us, and everything else should fade into the background if we're focused on that. And so this leads us to a point I brought up last week, that Satan, he doesn't need us to worship him. He doesn't need us to focus on him. He needs us distracted so he can steal our joy. He doesn't need us to be intentionally greedy. We don't have to have a chalkboard of the things I'm going to do to, to steal money from people for him to steal my joy. He just needs me to focus a little bit more on my bank account and the glory of the kingdom and the joy that comes with giving generously. That'll just fade into the background, won't it? He doesn't need me to be deliberately self-centered. If he can just get me to pay enough attention to my career, my opportunity to serve God's people, that's just going to fall into the background. It's going to blur out, isn't it? He doesn't need me to be recklessly undisciplined. If I'll just pay enough attention to my hobbies, he knows that the commitment to the spiritual disciplines, that'll just fade into the background because I've taken my eyes off of the treasure. He doesn't need me to denounce contentment. He knows that if I'm focused on my earthly comforts, it'll just happen naturally. I'll stop paying attention to my call to be content if I stop focusing on God. But there is some good news that while some have failed, we have some examples of those who have succeeded. We hear about Abraham. Abraham stumbles upon this treasure. He didn't do anything to earn it. God just walks up and says, hey, I chose you. He's promised a legacy that will go on forever. He's going to be a blessing to all nations. And then God tests him. He says, hey, I want that one and only son of yours. And what's Abraham do? He focuses on eternity. He looks at eternity and he says, you know what, my son, I love him, but I got to have that treasure. And God honors that. We hear about David, Solomon's dad. David stumbles upon a treasure, doesn't he? He's the shortest, he's the youngest of some no-name guy from some no-name tribe of Israel, and God chooses him to be king. He's made the greatest and the most respected king of all time, including today. But when God tells him to go dance like a fool in celebration, what's he do? He gives up all that dignity, all that respect to honor God. He's got his eyes focused on the eternal prize, not on this treasure that's sitting here beside him, the tangible treasure. We hear about Paul. Why did God choose Paul? Who knows? Paul, he has the, the respect of the community. He's got position, he's got power, he's got wealth. And God asks him to trade it all in for a life of hardship, for pain and for suffering. And Paul, he's got two choices. He's got this, this temporal treasure in front of him where he can have prestige and power, or he can have what God promises for eternity. And he says, that's just got to go away. I'm going to focus on this. And so each of these men had a choice, just like the first set. They could see the earth, earthly treasure in front of them, but they focused instead on the eternal treasure, the true treasure, the everlasting treasure that God offers. We're called to do it. We see people who have been successful doing it, and they've left us some good pointers. To be like the guy in this first parable, we need to recognize the value of the treasure we've found, just like he did. And then in our joy, we need to surrender everything to obtain it. If we look at Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, we get a little more instruction. It says, therefore, you should all be wondering what that's there for, but the, the passage itself is going to explain it. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. 
We're called to lay aside every weight and every sin. Just stop, just ignore it. Focus on the king. Focus on the joy. Focus on Jesus and let the other stuff go to the background where it belongs. But so often we get, we get focused on the sin. How do I conquer this? How do I conquer this? And we forget about the joy and the treasure that awaits us. And when we focus on the joy and the treasure like the man in this parable, it all just fades into the background. So the next thing we're going to look at is uh, an illustration. We're going to watch a video. Uh, Francis Chan, this is the rope illustration. So I generally try to come up with my own illustration, but I wasn't going to do any better than him. And so I could, I could fake it and bring my own rope up here, uh, but I'm just going to go ahead and show the video. So Francis Chan, for those of you who don't know, uh, he's an author and a pastor. He is very well known uh, for being down to earth and real uh, and these illustrations like this. And so this is an excerpt from a sermon that he did, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago uh, on a different passage. But I think it's the best illustration I can ever find of eternal focus and the struggle we have with distraction. So let's go ahead. This will be about, what, four and a half minutes and all of that time down. It's, it's, it's about the future. Paul's going, man, what am I going to look forward to at the end? I'm going to bring an illustration that this is like the first illustration I did. It was 20 years ago, but I can't think of a better way to, to explain it. Um, I actually didn't use a rope back then. I used a, remember a, remember a computer paper when uh, it was all stuck together? And it had the holes on the side that you had to peel off. Remember that? I remember getting a, a roll. And some of you guys have no idea what I'm talking about, which is crazy to me. But because uh, that was the best, you know. And um, and it never worked right because of the rolling things. But uh, but I, I had I remember being a youth pastor and I put uh, that computer paper all the way around the room. And uh, but I'm going to use a rope now because I can't find that computer paper. Um, imagine this rope. Okay, pretend this rope just goes on forever okay just imagination pretend it goes around the world a few times it doesn't it ends at the rock but uh let's just imagine this thing goes on forever now imagine that this rope is a timeline of your existence you just exist forever you see this red part this would represent your time on earth You've got a few short years here on earth, and then you've got all of eternity somewhere else. This is, this is your existence. And what blows me away is some of you, all you think about is this red part. It's all you think about. You're consumed with this. You go, oh man, I can't wait till here. You know, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to save, save, save so I can really enjoy this part right here. And you're consumed with that. And you're thinking, oh, man, am I going to get to travel? Am I going to eat well? Am I going to do this during this part? And I'm like, are you kidding me? What about this? What about this? What about, th what about all this stuff? It's, just, it's crazy to me because the Bible teaches that what I do during this little red part determines how I'm going to exist for millions and millions and millions of years forever. And, and so why would I spend this little red part trying to make myself as comfortable as possible, enjoying myself as much as I can? Paul says, look, I'm going to live my life for this mission. I'm going to spend my life, invest my life for this moment when I cross that finish line. See, I'm going to forget about all this stuff I could enjoy. And I'm not going to look around. I'm going to be like a runner just looking at that moment when I face God. Because when I face him, then I don't get this chance over again. We get one chance at this life on earth. And it can end at any second for any of us. We've got one chance at this. And then comes eternity. And I'm not going to be fooled. I'm not going to spend my life down here. See, people look at some of my decisions and go, oh, you're so stupid because that's going to really affect this. I go, no, you're stupid, because it's going to affect all of this. Man, I, I, I'm serious. I, I look. I look at the way people live, and I go, wow, that is so crazy. You are so crazy. You're going you're gonna to do that right now, just to enjoy right now, not even knowing if you have tomorrow, and you think that's smart and that I'm dumb? 
It doesn't make any sense. Paul goes, I'm not going to look around at all this stuff. And it's tempting. It's tempting to all of us. That's what I'm saying down here. It's crazy because everyone lives that way. Everyone lives for the red part. No one's thinking about the millions of years afterwards. It's, it's just this crazy deception that we can't get out of our minds. And Paul goes, I'm not doing that. He goes, I keep my eyes on that. I keep my eyes on that finish line. And I'm going to forget what's behind me. I'm not looking around. I'm just going to, I'm straining. He goes, I'm straining forward. I'm like stretching forward for that mark. I'm going to pass this thing. I'm going to live this out. And I'm going to face him. I'm going to come before the judges. And he's going to hand me that trophy. He goes, I'm going to get it. And I haven't gotten there yet. He goes, but you better believe I'm using every muscle, exerting every bit about me. Because I'm going to pass that line well. So I think this is a good analogy because that little red part, it catches our eye, doesn't it? That's Satan's plan. He's taken that rope and he's dipped to the end in the shiniest color he can find. He's put every kind of distraction into that little short part so that we don't even know there are millions and millions and millions of eternal years of rope after that. We get so focused on that little part, but God, Jesus tells us to focus on the eternal that everlasting treasure in that little red part, that little, that little temporal pile of gold is just meaningless to us if we will focus on the eternal. And so this transitions us into the second parable. And so like I said, it seems like it's the same, but it's actually the opposite side of the coin, teaching the same lesson. So this is in Matthew 13, uh, 45 and 46. It says again, The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. So we see here the kingdom of God is like the merchant. And this is noteworthy. In the first parable, a man representing you and me, goes in search of a treasure, the kingdom. But in the second parable, the merchant representing the kingdom, the kingdom is like a merchant, is seeking the treasure. If you don't have goosebumps yet, it's coming. In the first parable, we are told to go seek the kingdom and sell all to obtain it. But in the second parable, we're told the kingdom is doing the same thing. The kingdom isn't the treasure in this second parable. We are. Paul, you're the treasure. Alex, you're the treasure that the kingdom is seeking. They're opposites. The merchant is the kingdom, and he's seeking the treasure. And how many does he need to find before he sells everything? One. It's you, Ronnie, Zoe, any one of you. He finds one and he sells it all. You see, the first one, it calls us that when we find a treasure, we sell all. But the second one, it tells us he's already done it. It's the story of Jesus Christ. We hear about it in Philippians 2. Pastor Harry covered a little bit of it here. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. See, Jesus, he saw an eternal treasure down here and he said, Dad, I gotta go. I just found a treasure, I gotta go get it. I know I'm giving up everything here, but I gotta go get that treasure. 
And that's the attitude that we should have. He saw an eternal treasure in us, and we should see an eternal treasure in him, and we should focus on it. And we should look to his final instructions, the Great Commission, in Matthew 28. And we hear further instructions on where to go with this. He says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He secured his treasure, hasn't he? He's got all authority on heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He's telling us, hey, I redeemed the worthless for the great value. And now I want you to go do the same. Sell everything you have to go obtain this treasure. And he ends with something great, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He doesn't want us to forget that he's already redeemed his treasure in us. We should never forget it. We should never be distracted. He always has our back. He's always there for us to focus on. And so this leads us to our application as we round out this study of these two parables. The application is pretty simple. One, recognize the value of the treasure before you. Think about the value of eternal salvation. When that man found the treasure in the field, he knew what it's worth. He knew it's worth, and he knew he had to have it, and there was nothing that was going to stop him, and we should see eternal salvation. That rope that goes around and around and around, we should see that for what it is. It's the real treasure. And in our joy, we should surrender everything to secure it. In our joy, not out of obligation, not out of remorse, not out of, well, I guess I'll do this so that I can get that. In our joy, surrender all to obtain it. And when distractions show up, focus on the treasure. Don't focus on the distraction. You're not going to defeat the distraction by thinking about it more. You turn your mind back to Jesus. You turn your mind back to eternity. We see this when Peter tries to walk on water, right? As long as he's focused on Jesus, he's good. As soon as he takes his eyes off, what happens? Down in the water he goes. The same will be true of us. We have to focus on the joy of that eternal treasure. We'll close out with Philippians 4, 4 through 8, which is a great reminder. Again, this is Paul. This is one of my favorite passages. Paul reminds us that it's not that there aren't bad things going on. It's that we just can't focus on them because it'll just feed the distraction. It'll continue to draw us farther and farther. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Don't think about the distractions. Think about the treasure that's before you. This is what the man in the parable did. He didn't think about all the details. He thought about the treasure, and I got to go get it. And it's what Jesus did as he redeemed his life as if it were worthless to obtain that one pearl, you. Would you pray with me? Father, you are so good. 
God, how you see us as a treasure, we don't know. We don't know why you would do what you've done. Lord, we don't know what the kingdom is like. We don't know what that treasure is like. But God, we pray for perspective. We, pr we pray for focus. God, that you would move those distractions to the background and help us to focus on you, Lord. You are so good. And we don't deserve any of it, but your son saw value in us. He saw great value in us, and he redeemed us with his own life. God, thank you for your written word and your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the direction and the protection that you've offered us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We go now into our time of offering. So we take an offering in joy. There's a joy to be generous. It's not an obligation. We don't ask you to give out of obligation. God invites us to be a part of this church body. If you're new with us to here today, we don't want your money. We want that connection card so we can get to know you. Thank you.
The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up, and in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. This should bring us tremendous joy. Our vision here at First Baptist is to live in light of the gospel, and that's the calling of these two parables. To recognize the treasure that you are, the treasure that you've been offered, and to just live like it. Not to be distracted by all the noise going on, all the things going on in this world, but to focus on the joy and the treasure of the kingdom. Go in God's peace. You are dismissed. 